Mark. <clears throat> I was just outside. Welcome everybody to Permaculture Smackdown. Another week is here. Hello, Paul. How are you? Hello, Josiah. <laughs> I am large. How there are you? <laughs> I am not as large as you, but I am good. Uh, so today I want to talk about keeping your spring snow melt on your property. Biogasification versus rocket mass heater. And I think you wanted to talk about rocket mass ovens and spring minimalization. I just went through the whole minimalist thing, which I do every spring. <laughs> That's part of my, my spring cleaning is just getting rid of uh, everything almost. So what do you want to talk about first? Well, when you get rid of stuff, how do you get rid of stuff? I mean, like you're not throwing it away, right? Okay. So here's what I do. And what I just did is I went into my barn, which is like, I store all my stuff there that I don't use every day. And I said, I don't use this every day. Uh, I'm going to get rid of it all. So what I did is I called three friends. I said, Hey, you know how you like all the shit I have? It's yours. Come and get it first come first serve. These are the three people that I've invited. And one of my friends, they heard that name and were like, we got to get there before him. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so I had three friends come and take it all. Now you say, why wouldn't you just sell the stuff? That's what I get a lot of questions about. And the answer is I want my friends to have it. I want, um, because it's good stuff. This is not like just cheap shit you would find in a garage sale. This is good stuff. And I want my friends to have it so that if I ever need it in the future, I know who to borrow it from. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're my storage, but they get to use it, right? That's the fee for the storage fee is they get to use this stuff. And, uh, and two, I know it's going to people that I know will take care of it and uh, are good people. Yeah. Um, because you grow attached to some of this stuff, like fishing gear, your kayaks. I mean, there was all kinds of stuff. So uh, I've done that twice now in my life. And now, I mean, I am down to just what I need. The bare minimum, which I just love. The, only, the hardest part is the books. Getting rid of books is the hardest part for me. It's like, man, these are some good books. I have a lot of good books, but it's a lot of weight. And I live mobile. I travel a lot, so I can't have a whole lot of weight. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day about how there used to be a lot of boarding houses. And so what you would do is that there'd be like this 10 bedroom house and you'd effectively rent a, a bedroom in the 10 bedroom house. And then when you got there, you just needed like a suitcase. Um, there'd be a bed and a dresser and, you know, a lot of basic shit. And, um, and then you'd usually get one meal a day, like dinner and uh, anything else you want to do your Pretty much on your own now maybe on the weekend it'd be slightly different like uh uh on saturday you get breakfast instead of dinner everybody's kind of expected to go and eat elsewhere for dinner i don't know and um but anyway where did they all go and i think that where they all went had to do with you know largely with shaming and drama but it's like if you're in a boarding house whoever's house it is you kind of gotta live your life by their rules but the key is, is that if you don't like it or if you want to live somewhere else, you just pick up and go somewhere else. And, you know, all your shit fits in a suitcase. Um, yep. But I, but the thing is, is like, okay, you're, you're, you're getting rid of a bunch of books. You're getting rid of a bunch of toys. And it's, it's fair. It's, it's not getting used. Now, uh, I kind of think to myself, like, what I would rather see is something where you live in a community. And then it's like these people are pawing through your books regularly. You're pawing through their books regularly. Uh, you got some kayaks. They got some climbing gear um, and, and some snowshoes. And so then it's like, you know, hey, I haven't done this thing for five years. And there's these snowshoes sitting here. I'm going to check to see if whoever they are, maybe I can borrow them. And then I never had to buy snowshoes. I just, you know, borrowed those. So what would do you think you would have if you had a community, a big community of 
people that you would be sharing this stuff with? Would you have like a central location where it's like everybody bring the stuff you want everybody else to be able to use, like a library here? And this is the library of shit you can use. Here's your snowshoes, whatever. I I think that uh, first of all, like like let's say let's say you're gonna try. There's a couple of different ways to do community. One is is that you're gonna have like an eco village, and there's gonna be like you know a dozen little huts and a central gathering place. Or um, uh, another one would be like 20 people living under one roof. You've got a 12 bedroom house. And um, uh, there's 20 people living in there, but you've got like two or three living rooms, two kitchens, uh, you know, oodles of bathrooms of different degrees of awesome. And it's and so basically what happens is, is that you end up living in a far more luxuriant space and um, uh, for like less than half the cost of if you're trying to live in a studio apartment or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next thing is, is that um, I think for a lot of people, you know, they want to they want to live light. But you want to be able to like if you're going to be living in a, in a permaculture and homesteading environment, I mean, you're going to want to use some shovels. You know, you're going to want to have a rake around. You're going to want to you know, do some projects. You're going to want to do some green woodworking. You're going to want to, you know, you want to do a little of this and a little of that. And it's like, but if you're like doing this minimalist lifestyle and you're saying like, okay, if I haven't touched it in a year, it's got to go. Then um, it's like, okay, yeah, now it's really light, but now you're kind of living a shittier life. If you want to go and get that shovel that you didn't touch for a year, you got to call up that guy, ask to borrow it, are you going to walk over to his house or are you going to drive over to his house to borrow your former shovel? Um, stuff like that. I, I just kind of think that, I mean, when right now the way things are set up in America, it's like if you're going to rent a house or you're going to rent an apartment or whatever you're going to rent, it's like when you get there, nothing's there. There's no internet. There's no electricity. You know, uh, and then um, even if there's a wood heater of some kind, there's no firewood, uh, you know, you got to start over. You got to bring your own damn couch. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking like, why do I got to bring a damn couch? Now, of course, the flip side of, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is, is like, uh, like if you were to move into a house and there's already a couch there and already a bed there and already a whole bunch of stuff there. And you're like a non-smoker, and it was a smoker that was there before. It's like, okay, that's that's not going to work. That's uh, you know, and so, but you know, I don't know. There could be, or if you're allergic to cats, and they had cats, or if you're not allergic to cats, but they had cats. Right. <laughs> and it's yeah. like that cat decided to piss all over everything. And it's like that doesn't work. Other things that I think about is, uh, first of all, people like to be recognized for the things that they are providing, right? So like if you let someone borrow something, you want it like, yes, this came from me. People like that appreciation, like as opposed to a community a library style, like you never know who donated the books at a library. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'd like to thank that person and that person, and maybe they're thankless. They're like, yeah, I don't care if someone knows, but I'm sure there's, when you're donating like, you know, a thousand dollars, something, something huge, you want to be like, I donated this to the community and I want the community to know that. Um, so I see that being something to think about. And then the other thing is, especially with tools, it's like if you have a community resource of tools and then someone breaks that tool, one of those tools, or you see a tool laying out in the weather or rusty or something like that, it pisses people off. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so, so how do you mitigate that? Like, what are some ways to to work with that kind of stuff? Oh, that's, that is that is a really good point. Um, in our first year here, oh, the tool burn was insane. It was just nuts. Um, and and it was just through stupid. In fact, um, there was a guy who came in uh, with a draw knife, and you know, uh, a, a draw knife is supposed to be you know have a nice flat edge. But it's like it was kinked, Ooh, yeah. you know, and it's like, how did that happen? He says, well, I was just using it, you know, normal. 
and it's like it must i don't know how it got like but you know you put a little weight on it to kind of like get a good cut into the bark and everything and it's like it was it must have been a defect or something and so then uh it's like oh fuck uh tool burn oh we're just dying from tool burn and you don't want to just blame Wait. that guy that broke oh, no, it because no, it I'm, could have been who knows what. So yeah. so I'm like, okay, all right. So I, I, I let it go and like, all right, uh, damn, that sucks. Uh, we'll, we'll have to buy another another one, I guess. And then like uh, um, as soon as that guy leaves, another guy's standing there and he says, that guy's a fucking liar. I was watching him. He's been getting calls from his girlfriend all day long. And um, he's not doing any work. And so suddenly his phone rings. And so instead of just answering the fucking phone like a normal human being, he decides to do some sort of magical dismount. I'm the only other person there. He must have thought like he's going to impress me with his magical dismount. So what he tried to do is lean in on it and, and then leap off of it off the log. And do like, you know, ta-da. Instead, the fucking thing bent. And he just about took out his front teeth as he smashed his face into the log oh. because it bent. Yeah. And it's like, so no, that's from fucking off. It's not, it's not using the tool properly. No. So then I called the first guy in. And I and he was like, this guy was all about, oh, I'm all about the environment. I'm all about, you know, and, and he was going to like move his tiny house here and shit. And he'd been here for like three days. Talk, 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 talk. Everybody should love each other and on and on and on. And I said, get the fuck off my property. I don't need lying sex of shit who burn through my tools and lie about it. Get out. Get out now. And so I kicked him off. I'd be glad to tell you his name, but it's, I feel like that's not appropriate. <laughs> Publicly bash somebody like that. It's, but it's like uh, we had other people too where it's like negligence. But at the same time, there, there is stuff that's going to happen because people just don't know. But, uh, but this is how Ant Village was born too. Is It's like we're kind of like doing the math and coming up with like, holy shit, we're spending like $1,500 a month per person uh, to come here and and stuff. And then on top of that, we're kind of starting to get the feel of like, they're putting in about four hours a week of work. And it's like, so we're ending up paying them like $100 an hour. Uh, this, is, this isn't sustainable. And we're paying them $100 an hour for like $3 an hour work. And it's, it's kind of like, we can't, we can't do this. So then we came up with uh, Ant Village, where the idea is like, you get a bare acre and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll let you use some big equipment because you got to, uh, for some of these things. But other than that, no, all the tools are yours. And so now suddenly people want to get tools to really last. Although what's funny is, is that um, through an arrangement, uh, like like some of the ants came and helped out with the project. And because of that, then um, uh, I basically credited them $1,000. And it was like, what do they want to spend it on? So they wanted to get uh, one of these new, cool steel uh, chainsaws that are all electric, the, the cordless electric. Apparently, they're really, really great. And um, between, between them, apparently, they just drove it into the ground. And um, it's like now, like if anybody uses it, they have to bring their own chain because the chains, the chains that came with it, um, all all are shot. And um, apparently, it just seems like uh, they, like apparently, this 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 saw is in poor condition now because they all just no one would look after the community product. Nobody wants to sharpen the this the chain and all that and oil make sure there's proper oil bar oil in it and all that stuff. Yeah. But if it's your chainsaw, <clears throat> you take I mean, you're gonna get twenty years of life out of it because you're taking such good care of it. So uh in West Virginia, we, we for those that don't know, we had a farm in West Virginia. And luckily most of the people that we had at the farm with us in that community environment were ex-military so they understood this but what we had was a tool checkout system 
Um, so that, you know, we had the garage and there's all the tools and you had to, you know, write out time out and time in for when you took the tool and we had PMCS days. So for those that don't know in the military, there's a thing called PMCS, which is preventative maintenance checks and services. There's a before a during and an after PMCS. Um, so, but we just have one PMCS checklist. So each tool had its own checklist of preventative maintenance checks and services, things you had to do. And then once a week or once a month, we'd go in and just go through every tools, PMCS, go through the check boxes, which is things like sharpen the edge at this angle with this tool and oil it and, and things like that. And it, and it had all the steps and it's, it's military, right? So it's like a fifth grader could figure this out. If they're able to read, as long as you can read, you can figure out what you need to do. It's real step-by-step -step and easy to do. Um, but it took time, you know, it took a lot of time to set up the PMCS for each of those tools. It took a lot of time and money to organize all the tools in a checkout check-in system. So like we had a, a pegboard for every tool and had an outline of the tool on the written on the pegboard. So you knew where to hang. And I think you have something similar to that. Um, so you knew where the tools went, but anyway, PMCS uh, was, it just had to, be, because on the PMCS sheet, you're also writing any defects that are there. So you have a log of its the life of the tool. Who had it when? What happened to it? You know, it was in good condition when it got here and then bad condition after. Who had it in between those two times? Things like that. And then they could explain what happened to it. Right. We've, I've, um, <clears throat> I mean, basically ever since uh, after the 20 month party, then um, I pretty much just locked down the shop. And um, and then for projects, usually it's like, okay, we'll just use the simplest tools kind of a thing. And, um, but now it's also uh, Fred manages the boot camp, And so Fred is really good at, at training people on how to properly use a tool. And then he's watching very, very carefully. Whereas before Fred, the guy that would do it was very loosey goosey and stuff like that. So it's like, uh, and then, <clears throat> Basically, it seems like the guy before he just wanted to fire everybody, and he just wanted he wanted to to, to give him a tool, not tell him how to use it, not show him how to use it, and then and then they break it, and then he wanted to fire them, um, which is kind of weird firing a volunteer. I, I mean, like I kind of feel like if you didn't get proper training in it, that's a that's a pass. But I, I do also feel like if if you are really fucking around with something and you bust it, it's like um, you know, the, the thing that whoever busted it is kind of like, oh, it should have it should have been built stronger. You know, I should have been expecting somebody would be fucking around with it. And, um, and it's, all right. Along the lines of what you were saying about uh, giving your stuff away um, and going, we we have here uh, uh, two free shelves, which are going to hopefully this year be expanded to be um, two free sheds. Oh, cool. Um, and and then the idea is is that you know everybody who you know has something that's fairly usable and don't want it anymore, put it up. There's two. There's always got to be two, and so you you know so basically there's there's one that's being filled, and the other one that's not being filled, and then at some point in time what you're going to do is is you're going to take all the stuff that didn't go away for however long it was, and get rid of it somehow. Probably maybe maybe take it to the goodwill. Maybe I don't know. Um, and maybe you're going to go through some of it and you're going to say, no, some of this stuff is still pretty good. Or, or uh, the other thing is a boneyard. And so um, we've moved our boneyard at base camp up to the lab. And so there's, a, there's an area there that's got a bunch of stuff that's like big. And, um, you know, it's probably got some use of some sort. So it looks like a junkyard, but it's tucked away where nobody sees it. And when we need materials for stuff, you go up there and you kind of wander the boneyard and get material. Oh, yeah. That was great when I was a kid because uh, I grew up in a very small community area, kind of where uh, Erica and Ernie live. Mm -hmm. um, and so the dump there was very similar. It was like people, there was a separate dump and then there was like, there was a regular dump for your garbage stuff. And then there was stuff that people were like, this might actually still have a use. And they would throw it in that dump. And that dump was great when I was a kid. Man. <laughs> I loved crawling around in there and finding all kinds of stuff. Um, 
but yeah, the the free shelf was awesome at your place. Tuesday used that. I remember once I was like, man, we really need a, a tarp or something. Um, and Tuesdays, and so I was like, I'll go buy a tarp. And Tuesdays, like, why? There's there's uh, something in the free shelf that could work. It wasn't exactly what I wanted, but it was like, you're right. We could totally use it, and it would work. And I wouldn't uh, have to go buy some new piece of garbage. There are what will eventually be garbage. And so, yeah, yeah, free shelf was great. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a great way to fly. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing it expanded and we do more with it. Um, I got a, I got a lot of ideas about, you know, more things to do with that whole space where the free shelf is, but that's a whole other story for another day, which yeah, it's stupid news. Uh, um, and, and speaking of, you said, what if somebody gives you a, a bunch of money and you want, they want to know about it. And it's like, so there is this guy, Bill Krim, I'm going to say his name because he's awesome. And so, uh, every year he sends a Christmas gift, uh, an Amazon gift card. And, um, the amount is really significant. And, um, uh, what he's done in the past is he'll send two gift cards and one of them is for, you know, uh, world domination. Do whatever you got to do to take over the world. And then another one that's, that's labeled something like pure silly fun. <laughs> uh, and this last time, it wasn't pure silly fun. It was for like uh, uh, puppies, kittens, pie, and pie accessories or something like that. And so um, and though we, that second one is hard to spend. You know, it's got to be spent on Amazon. So it's like, what do you buy at Amazon? It's pure silly fun. But it said kittens, and um, so Jocelyn, Jocelyn uh, uh, decided to get. She saw cat footprints in the snow this last winter, so she decided to get uh, like a heated uh, water bowl, and mm -hmm. as she kept putting fresh water in it, and there got to be more cat footprints, <laughs> and so there's this feral cat that was hanging around, and. Uh, uh, Jocelyn just got to be best friends with this cat. And now we think that this cat is pregnant. Um, and uh, uh, so now we're, we've been working to, to set up something in that kind of space so that the cat might have a place to go and, and hide from other predators to have little kitties. I love barn cats. I hate house cats. I love barn cats that are fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my favorite cats. Okay. Barn cats that are fixed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be it'll be cool to have little little kittens. I've I've kind of got some mixed stuff about uh, uh, cats and dogs and uh, uh, getting them uh, neutered and spayed. And of course, right now all of society is just very overwhelming in favor of getting them fixed. And um, you know. And it like makes sense, total logic. Too many animals are euthanized every year. But I also remember uh, in Missoula, uh, like 20 years ago, I went into the Humane Society to get a cat. And um, they wanted to know, well, do you have a job? Yes, I do. Then you can't have a cat. What? And, and it's like, so, so basically they, they, they felt like, you gotta, you gotta be. There's gotta be somebody at home all day with this cat, which is fixed. And by the way, you can't let that cat outside. And, huh. and so you gotta, you gotta care for the cat the way we tell you. And there's gotta be somebody there all day to keep the cat company. And if you can't do that, we'd rather kill the fucking cat than give it to somebody like you. Even though it's fixed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'd rather kill the fucking cat than give it to somebody like you. And and it's, so just I, lie to him. <laughs> see, I, and I, I have a well, lot of problems. Yeah, well, there's someone I work, but I have uh, someone that's home all the time, and the cat will always be indoors. And then I take it home and I put it in the barn. <laughs> <laughs> so Your food is now mice. Go. So here's a here's a feral <laughs> cat, and it's still real skittish, but it'll come up to Jocelyn. All I'm thinking is, is this kind of like, okay, so far the cat, I mean, the cat is like killing anything that moves, you know? So, and we had, we had a really, two years ago, we had a really bad chipmunk problem. They obliterated everything we tried to grow. 
And so the idea of having this cat, um, you know, like real close by to keep the chipmunk problem in check is this. But now Bill Mollison made a statement of saying there is no place in permaculture for for house cats. And I don't. I think what he meant was not not in the house, but like that that kind of cat, the domesticated cat. Oh, I disagree. Well, that's that's what you know Mollison mm. said. So I kind of yeah. feel like I feel like most of the homesteads I've been on have had cats. Yeah. And well, mice are a big problem. Mice are a huge problem, especially when you're storing like grains and foods and things, uh, or trying to dehydrate things. And uh man. I mean, you want the natural predators. You want to encourage natural predators uh before you bring in unnatural predators into the ecosystem, for sure. Like obviously it would be better if naturally uh, you were able to get lots of snakes on your property that were taking care of the mice problem. And then you had lots of birds that were taking care of the snake problem. Like there, you had an ecosystem going, um, but boy, yeah. it's nice having a, a fix right away. <laughs> now I mentioned before the show started that I wanted to throw in a thing about rocket ovens. Um, and then you said rocket mass ovens and it's like, I have no idea what the hell that is. <laughs> No, I said, uh, well, maybe I, maybe I did misspeak, but I was talking about uh, the difference between biogas and rocket mass, like doing oh, okay. a, a, that versus that. And then you were like, I also want to talk about rocket ovens. Um, first, before we jump into that, the next topic, I want to jump over to our chat. So for those that don't know, uh, if you are a Patreon supporter of Paul's, a, a student of Permaethos, uh, or one of our members, then you get access to this special chat thing where we talk to people. And so I want to go through it real quick. Josh, uh, <laughs> learning about nuclear power. What'd you learn, Josh? What, tell us all about it. Uh, uh, what did you say? <laughs> just got a Watchman rocket stove. It rocks. Oh, okay. So is that Matt? Watchman. Watchman rocket stove. So the URL you put in doesn't look like a watchman.com site. It's a mybigcommerce.com site, but I'll share it here with folks and with Paul. Yeah, that looks like an outdoor, you know, cook stove. Yeah, this is not a rocket mass. This is a rocket yeah. cook stove. Yeah. It looks cool. I mean, I would cook on it. It looks really cool. So, uh, Josh, uh, I want to just ask Josh real quick. Three hundred and seventy-five dollars. Holy crud! Yeah, is it? It's not stainless steel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you're proud of your product. Cool. So, Josh, Josh posted to our chat thing, learning about nuclear power. Uh, Josh, do you do you have a nuclear reactor at your house? I'm just curious. I mean. Is that you have you some uranium in your backyard? Maybe he's got uranium in his backyard. I'm I'm just gonna lots way more people than you think have uranium in their backyard. You know, uh, when I was on Mount Spokane, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, we had to um, uh, uh, we had we had a lot of trouble with compasses because uh, the uh, um, uh, whenever you would try to do anything, it would go wonky because there was apparently a uh, uranium mine about 100 yards, an abandoned uranium mine 100 yards off of our property line. Yeah. There was enough uranium in the soil so that everything was a little bit wonky. Well, you can get uh, uh, failed well tests. Your water can tests can fail because there's uranium in the water from these veins of uranium in the, in the soil. Hmm. We had that uh, in a community that uh, started up a little while ago. So it's really expensive to get a filter system that can filter out uranium. You get a, it's really expensive. The filters are with the most, yeah, it's crazy. Wow. Wow. Well, I had our water tested here, and our water quality is really good. Um, I am I am shutting down stuff because my cpu is pegging out okay i don't know so, what's causing it josh says he's uh in multi-screen right now so he's watching us on one side and kirk Sorensen on the other and kirk Sorensen is a 
uh big nuclear fuel advocate right or like he does some kind he's like into i remember seeing a ted talk it was like some kind of fuel liquid uranium fuel or something way of doing nuclear power um which i'm uh, i got no love for the nuclear power myself yeah me neither i mean I get it, but there's so much better ways. Like the cost of a nuclear power plant, holy crap, how many solar panels could you get for people? Or windmills? Or <laughs> I I kind of feel like um, I'm not very interested in that stuff because uh, even, I don't know, I suppose that if you had uranium or thorium or something in your backyard, I'm not... I'm not sure how uh, good people like, like, do you have a way that you can do this yourself? Yeah, I think there needs to be a movement uh, or I would love to see a movement in America where like some county somewhere or hopefully, and then a bunch of counties start doing it where they're like, you need to start providing your own power. Like we have the capability now it's time for your, everybody to just start making their own power and, uh, and see how it works. <laughs> but Someone's got to take that risk. Uh, let's see here. Before my father lends out a book, he signs it and writes, Bakinsa, book I know I'll never see again. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, tool, collective, tool collectives demonstrate clearly one of the sev several problems with communism. Ooh, Josh, go into details. I love talking about communism. Paul hates it. Uh, <laughs> talking about communism. I don't know if he hates communism. I imagine yeah. he does. Uh, the no S SPCA will do a house check before adopting the cats can only be indoors. What the hell is SPCA? Socialism practicing cat adoption. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. Tough day, oh. Montana. What? Oh well, this what I know because uh, the testicle festival. But I don't know what, why there's no more evil can evil days. I've never been to evil can evil days. I do. I know that evil can evil days are out of Butte, um, and uh, uh, but I don't know why there's no more evil can evil days. But the testicle festival is uh, a thing. But where, that's actually the Rocky Mountain Oyster Festival, right? Or is that a separate yeah. festival? Okay. No, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's the same thing, and apparently it's not going to happen anymore. Apparently, like last year, they kicked somebody out for being, you know, behaving inappropriately while drunk. Yeah. And then um, uh, so somebody was like driving them back to Missoula. And then the guy grabbed the wheel and turned it while they're on the freeway. And um, the guy that grabbed the wheel lived, but the other two people on the vehicle died. And Did he commit suicide? I imagine no. if I did something like that, I would probably I might commit suicide, kill two innocent people. So yeah, I, I think he's still <laughs> alive. Um, but the testicle festival is kind of like okay, so it'd be like exactly the same and totally opposite from like the Oregon Country Fair. Uh, the Oregon Country Fair is going to have like twenty thousand hippies getting together for three days, and lots of nudity. Lots of drums. Are they going to be eating nuts? I mean, you know, <laughs> that was the whole Tesco festival, right? It was like, the, it wasn't the whole thing, but a, a part of it where they were, had tables laid out with these yeah. people that would cook like bull testicles and these different flavors. Right. Yeah. That part, that part's kind of like the cheap excuse, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, we're all going to get together and eat something we don't normally eat. Yeah, yeah. But then they would have like all the bikers would come. It was like bikers, lots and lots of bikers. And then, you know, much the same as the uh, Oregon Country Fair, lots of nudity, uh, lots of music, uh, you know, a lot of kinds of, apparently a lot of drunkenness, a lot of fights, um, things like that. So it's, it sounds like the guy that's been putting it on for a long time, he's kind of like, um, nope, I'm done. I'm good. Um, I, think, I think we're not going to do this anymore. So apparently it's ended. It's not happening anymore. Yeah. Um, so, oh, well. Uh, into the testicle festival. Oh no! A little less culture in Montana, I guess. That that is kind of a Montana cultural thing. Mitchell says, uh, "I'm liking this episode as usual." Paul is way cool. You too, Josh. So good for you, Josh. You're cool. Yeah. The ash pile, <laughs> the cool plant. 
is more radioactive than anything else you were exposed to. Okay. That's yeah. true. I, I think there's coal has got some serious, serious problems. And it's like we're not we're not doing the right thing with it. It's a mess. But we got a uh, for some reason, Eric, who was that? Shit, I lost my. Uh, someone said gave this link to the this uh, evil Knievel museum. Apparently, we must look at this and come visit. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, so <laughs> I've never been that much of an evil Knievel, um, you know, uh, aficionado. I guess so. Yeah, me, me. All right. Um, Hey, you really didn't go into the tool communism thing. I was kind of interested in talking about that. Let's see. <laughs> LFTR with wind and solar, and we can wipe out 68% of CO2. LFTR. What's LFTR? Wow. Anyway. All right. So okay. You're, you're asking me about communism stuff, and it's like my answer is I have no real fucking idea. Uh, um, I mean, people want to talk about communism or socialism or capitalism. Are you or, much of a history buff? Do you go into like the history of nations? Uh, and, uh, I, not I really. Love that stuff. I go into. Not it. really. <laughs> I, I mean, there's some of the stuff I'm I, I'm fairly knowledgeable at, but it's not really my thing. But the big thing is, is it just kind of seems like every time you want to start talking about communism or not communism or whatever, then um, it just gets into this. It's like people people that are up for it, they just want to argue about it or something, you know? And and uh I I kind of feel like uh my stuff is is more about like um how can I personally live a more luxuriant life? Uh and by while at the same time being kinder to my fellow human beings. And you know what? If we're gonna talk about history and, and what are things how about the fact that so many children are dying of cancer? You know, it's like can we focus on that a little bit? Um, uh, how the other thing is 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 this like uh, we've got so much shaming or stupidity around stuff? Like we'll only do things if somebody makes money at it, and it's, it's kind of like uh, I'm all for people making money, but I'm all I'm not I'm against people passing laws that are just so somebody can get fucking rich. Here's what I think I, th I see happening is um, the biggest things that are given away for free like when someone donates money or or does something charitable the the biggest uh, the, the times i see that happening the most is from wealthy people right like I, it's hard to donate a bunch of stuff that affects a great amount of people uh if you're poor i it's don't think like true. you gotta feed yourself before you can feed others kind of thing and so there's the um when I see the super wealthy doing things, not necessarily for free, but maybe they're doing things that otherwise would not have been done. You look at like uh, SpaceX and uh, what's that guy's name? It's, uh, Elon Elon Musk. Yeah, Elon he Musk. Kinds of crazy stuff that otherwise would not have been done, um, and he does it because he's super wealthy. He can afford to do crazy things and try new things that otherwise people would not have tried, and. Uh, and knowing that there might not be a profit in this. I think part of where Elon's going, like even with, with PayPal, I think a beautiful thing, if you look at Elon's history, you're asking me about history, is that for everything he tried and it worked out, he's got like two or three things that he tried and, and failed. Oh, yeah. Um, and, but he started with PayPal, uh, which, is, which has done really well. And so I think that there's, uh, uh, I mean, that's that's what a great example and i think a lot of the stuff what he's doing if you in fact if you look at the tesla electric uh vehicle as well as looking at paypal he looked at it and he said this is just so brain dead simple so obvious you know it, it it's like a cakewalk to just do it but nobody's doing it and and he stepped in and he did it now with the electric vehicle it's so brain dead simple, but before Elon came along with the Tesla, with, before the Tesla Roadster, most people, 99% of the people would say an electric vehicle, it is not possible for an electric vehicle to go faster than 40 miles per hour. And it, it is not possible 
for an electric vehicle to have a range of more than 40 miles. And it's like, these are just, these are facts. These are just absolutes, you know? And so it's kind of like, um, no, this is, this is not true. Those limitations come from bullshit. And mm -hmm. so it's like, um, uh, so anyway, I, I think it's really great that, that Elon stood up and the way he did it. First, we're going to make a car for extremely rich people. And uh, then that'll give us the money so that we can make like something Mercedes level. Then we're going to make something that's going to be more like the general consumer vehicle. Yeah, yeah, and it and it broke apart the the hold that uh, gasoline engine vehicle manufacturers had on electric vehicles because the, the, for a time, who killed the electric car? That documentary there was there there were electric cars, but nobody was allowed to own them. They would only right. leave them out. And uh, and so Tesla came around and said, no, yeah, you can buy one totally. And then those became really popular. And now the rest of the automotive industry is like, OK, we got to start making these for sale where people can actually buy them so we don't steal them back when we don't you know, like the results of the competition against our gas vehicles. And now I was talking to a buddy that works for Volkswagen and he says they're working on um, a 350 mile range electric. They've got a few. They've got a new Volkswagen bus coming out that um, that looks really good to me because you know um, for our needs here we we need uh, basically some kind of van to port people around, and uh, that would be that'd be really nice. I if, want a truck. If I could get a truck with a 350 mile range, whoo! Yeah, especially they're... one that could tow. <laughs> Even if I could get 200 out of one that could tow. That would be phenomenal. Well, you saw that Tesla has a semi truck coming out, right? I did. Yeah, yeah, that looks cool. But that's going to be another super wealthy thing. There's a, <laughs> there's a truck out right now that you can get that's called the Workhorse, but I think its range is like 150 miles. Um, but I think it's kind of like you know, 150 miles is a is a great range if you can recharge in less than 10 minutes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But but right now it's like okay you get a Tesla it has a 300 mile range, and then uh, you it's go and you day charge day. it for like 50 minutes and then uh, it seems like that's what most people with Teslas do is they'll charge them for 50 minutes and that'll get you like another 240 miles or something, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's kind of a pain in the ass. Now apparently this but it's not for semi truck drivers because they can pull over to a a truck stop. And the truck stop has the showers, restaurants, like they can sit and chill while the truck's charging up. True, true. Um, now, uh, Porsche has come out with an electric car, and apparently it can be uh, reach 80% charge in 15 minutes. And it's because um, the amount of power that goes through the wire into the car is like uh, this enormous amount. It's, it's like four or five or eight times more than what a Tesla does. Mm -hmm. So it's like this, just this enormous amount of power. Um, and, and then there's some talk about how that's going to become the room. All right. But electric vehicles, I mean, electric vehicles, I think, are really cool, and like it's an important thing for the world, for for permaculture folks and stuff like that. And it and it's like you want to have a truck. There is a truck. Um, uh, there, hopefully, there's going to be some. It sounds like there's going to be some more trucks coming out really soon that are all electric, um, and some hybrids coming soon too. Um, and I'm not uh, interested. In, here's what I want. I want the chassis and the the motor. And that's it. So that I can take like the frame of my pickup truck and the, the body of uh, the uh, internals of my pickup truck and put it on that frame because I don't want to buy a new truck. I don't do that. <laughs> I don't buy new vehicles. I always buy old used vehicles. Now, your truck is a diesel truck, right? Yeah. What you have now. Okay. I wish I would love a hybrid diesel electric. That would be really cool, I think. So Josh says he is working on a pickup truck. Um, and and it's like yeah he's been talking about it a long time but it's like he's got to get to the point that he has a prototype and then he pre-sells and then it's I like think he, years later that it's really smart going into the semi industry I think that's a really smart move right right 
Um, but but right now he's he's having trouble selling the Model Threes. Like he's having trouble keeping up with demand, and um, he's yeah, really sleeping suffering. on the factory floor. I heard. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, there's there's a guy that uh, uh, really gives a shit about you know having it work well. But um, anyway, all right, let's talk about something. I mean, I think all the stuff about Elon Musk and all of his magical stuff is well covered like everywhere else on the internet. And, and so there's a bunch of stuff that we talk about that is not covered anywhere else on the internet that I'm aware of. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was biogasification versus rocket mass. And the reason this sparked up is I was watching a YouTube, there's, I can't remember the name of the channel, Alternative Living or something, YouTube channel, where they go around and they go to all these people that have tiny homes and stuff like that and um, just video them and share it with people. Uh, and this one place had this, I couldn't find the product, but it's a, it looks like a greenhouse from the outside, but it has a chamber and there's stuff and greens in there. And then there's a, two, a pipe that goes into their house. And apparently they're making biogasification from their greens and using that with their cook stove. That's how they're cooking their food. And I thought that was really cool. Uh, what a great idea. But I want to hear your thoughts. Have you even seen this product or heard of this? I haven't seen this product or heard of this. I'm familiar with John Payne's stuff um, where, you know, he made this mountain of compostables and then he threw like something uh, tarpish over it. And then he had a bunch of inner tubes to kind of capture the biogas. It must be something similar. It was small. I was I was really impressed. I was like. I would imagine you would need, yeah, manures and stuff like that. But I know that there's a lot of stuff happening right now in India, or as the English call it, India. <laughs> uh, but in India, they, they've got stuff where it's like everybody poops in this thing, and then there's a big crank, and you kind of crank the cranky thing, kind of stirs it all up, and then you've got your methane kind of biogases coming off of it to capture that, and they use that for cooking. Okay. Um, there's there's quite a bit of that going on, but then apparently, like my understanding is, is that um, people poop, uh, like everybody in the house doing that. It's like not quite enough for all your cooking needs if you're cooking a lot. That's the normal biogas that I've seen has been poop involved. Yeah, and I don't think they were using poop for this one. Well, maybe they were using their composting toilet for it too. But I think what they were doing was using some kind of worm like a mealworm or something. And then they were using, uh, and then it was greens they were putting in, but they didn't show it enough. You know, they were, they were more concentrating on all the other, there was a ton of stuff these guys had done and they were just mentioned it and like showed it. And I was like, what is that? And I was trying to find it. I can't find it. Bearpaw says, check out, check out Dr. Gobar. Uh, can you provide a link URL? Because I type in Dr. Gobar and I get all kinds of crap. That's hey, isn't that one of the guys? Isn't that one of the guys that uh, James Bond killed? <laughs> no, uh, is that what he saw? Check out Dr. Gobar. See how he did. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I made that up. Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So uh, anyway, uh, so would you say if you could have an easy gasification system, First of all, I don't think it could replace. I well, I, I would th say a hurdle you would have to get over to compete with rocket mass would be uh, being able to produce the biogas even in the severe winter. Well, okay, let's let's talk about a rocket mass heater versus something like let's say you had biogas and it was really easy to do. Um, and so the the thing is, is with a biogas system, you wouldn't need the mass from a rocket mass heater. You could just produce however much heat you want 24 seven. It could just keep doing it because it's got all the gas. And, and so the cool thing about rocket mass heater is you build a fire and two days later, you're still harvesting the heat. But you could do that with biogas, couldn't you? Couldn't you use the biogas to- Oh, sure, but, but then why bother? You know, it's like, uh, okay, so here you are, it's, you're in Montana, you need heat. And then so you could have this thing that could generate a whole lot of heat or a little bit of heat. And what would probably be easier is if it just puts out a little bit of heat all the time, like the mass on a rocket mass heater does. 
-hmm. And it's like, it takes no effort. It's all thermostat controlled. Whereas with a rocket mass heater, you, you at least got to like haul in some wood and then you got to build a fire. Whereas a thermostat, it could all be taken care of automatically. Right. So there are, there would be advantages to something like that. But now my understanding is, is like, well, with John Payne, what he did was he had a huge coil of pipe out there in that massive compost pile, which by the way, 10 feet high and 10 feet wide. You know, so it's 10 by 10 by 10. That's a big fucking compost pile. So, um, they got to maintain. And, and then, right, it only lasts for 18, for him, it lasted 18 months. That's long, which is, which is still a hell of a long ride. But then, um, he would harvest the heat from the pile and route the heat in to be his hot water for his house, as well as the heating for the house. And then he got, um, uh, you know, the gas, the biogas off of it, which he used for cooking, not for heating his house, but just for cooking. Um, but then he also tried to run his truck. But now we're getting into the whole space of like where gasoline is really kind of magical because a gallon of gasoline has like, I don't know, 200 times more calories than a gallon of biogas. And, and so it's like, you would have to have this giant balloon in the back of your truck to right. hold enough biogas just to get to town one way, <laughs> you know? And, and it's like, it's, it's not. So he, he did run his truck on the biogas that he collected from his pile, but I think he could only go like a mile and a half. But people have been doing gasification with wood chips and, and stuff. I mean, that's right. been going on since World War II. Sure, so, sure. Yeah, it's still, one, but. And, and 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 how many of them do you see on the road? Why and why is that? And it's like because it takes a huge fucking amount of material to get you down the road because the amount of calories in a gallon of gasoline is huge. It's just nuts how many how many calories there are in a gallon of. It's so energy dense. It's just crazy. Um, and so then you start talking about these other things and it's like, they're not nearly as energy dense. Right. And so if you're going to travel with this stuff, then <laughs> you're going to need a lot of it. And that's where you get to the whole space of like, let's have an electric car. And it's like, but it can only go 40 miles. <laughs> what I found was, uh, with the gasification from wood was that they, they got it down where you can go pretty far off of chips, like wood chips uh, or pellets. But it's like, okay, but I'm not going to get freaking pellets. I, I, this is the whole thing I don't like about pellets. It's the same with rocket mass you know, stuff, is that I'm not making pellets. And, it, and especially if I'm driving and I'm relying on that as a fuel source, where the hell am I getting pellets? I want to just be able to get some sticks off the road and run off that. But yeah, it just can't happen. It's just not there yet where they can get extract enough carbon to fire uh, the engine long enough like they can with gasoline. Okay. All right. Are, so are I think, yeah, I think electric's the best way. I think uh, once we start, there's so much, so many advancements with electric, you can have, they're making oh. a solar paint. You can paint, they like just solar power paint all over your car. They got uh yeah, but is that, I mean, like, what kind of toxic it's not as efficient. That? Oh, yeah. Well, what kind of toxic ache is in solar panels? Yeah, uh, I, I'm worried uh, about that. I am yeah. worried about that. Yeah. So, um, they can generate electricity from your brake system. Like, you apply the brakes, charges the battery, things like that. Uh, you know, it's not, it doesn't 100% circulate, but it, it's, oh, it's, especially when you look at, like, semi-truck drivers, and they're going down those steep, you know, there because if you're on electric, you're not really gearing down like you do in an engine to go down those massive hills, right? So, so are you applying a brake system, or is the battery just not like how does how do you a Jake brake? Eh. Along these lines, yeah. When you've been at my house, then you've seen that thing that we got on our rocket mass heater, where it's that little fan, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you, if you look closely at it, you can see it's got a little teg pad in there so it's got the part that goes down to the heat source and then it's yeah, got like called? a heat sink on it and then it's got a little teg pad with two wires coming out of it going up to the motor on the fan that blows the fan so basically 
uh, when there's a differential of heat, then it generates a small amount of electricity. So now uh, in the last week, I remember seeing something where they've come up with some kind of super thin film that they could basically put on all kinds of stuff. Yeah, there you go. So like like that. The one I the one I have is like in the middle there. Although I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, shit, I paid more than that. <laughs> I'm a, what? Thirty bucks? <laughs> oh man, I was robbed. It probably doesn't work as well as yours. I that paid was like 119. A, yeah, I paid 120 bucks for mine. Yeah, this is. I, yeah, you pulled up one that said 30 bucks. I'm like, what? 30 <laughs> bucks. This one. So, yeah. All right. Anyway. But so in the last week, there's something about this this thin thin film that can be put on almost any electronic or electric contraption, and and then it will generate electricity from the the captured heat, and I'm kind of thinking like. If you start slapping that kind of shit on an electric car, is it going to extend the range like, I don't know, 15 or 20 percent? Um, and then uh, and plus another thing is like the batteries, in order to get long life out of the batteries, you need to like have a cooling system. So would this stuff kind of act like a cooling system? Um, and then uh, the next thing is, is like, uh, okay, you're tooling down the road. It's kind of generating electricity as you're burning electricity. Um, but the next thing is, is like, um, uh, uh, what about um, being able to uh, have, like you're saying, the solar paint or solar panels over the car? Will, will I mean, granted, it's, it's, it's not going to, like, I've heard something about like, if you leave your car parked in an office parking lot for eight hours and it's a sunny day, it'll give you enough electricity to travel four miles. And I kind of feel like I would think it would be closer to 12. And then I kind of think that it's like, if we start playing that game, we could probably in time get that up to 40. And that means that if you leave your car parked all weekend, then it'll be charged come Monday morning in mm -hmm. time for your commute and shit. Plus your car is just sitting out there and what's what's happening all around your car while it's sitting out there? There's wind blowing around. That could be generating electricity. Maybe, maybe. I, I kind of like the idea of like, um, with the electric car, we're just getting started. Oh the, yeah. The, the room for optimization is tremendous. Oh, yeah. I think we're going to start seeing stuff where it's like, oh yeah, you can charge these things in 10 minutes. And uh, with one charge, you can go a thousand miles. And uh, so like you could basically be at home and go on a long trip and wherever you go, there's charging stations everywhere. Um, but then the next thing you're worried about is how are these things getting, how are these charging stations getting their power? Because that expands. Think about how many oil stations uh, or, or pumps there are out there and how much it takes to pump out that oil. Well, okay, so now how are these electric charging stations getting the power the, gener the power generated? Uh, is that from oil? Or do they have like some huge solar plant somewhere? Well, all that solar is generated by oil. Like they create those solar pans, uh, panels out of oil. And so Josh is going, this is why nuclear power is so great. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I think nuclear power is better than oil, but I don't think it's the best solution. I think wind and solar are the best solutions, but you got to generate. Hopefully you can surpass the amount of energy it takes to create a, like you can create, you can generate more energy from the sun than it, than it takes to create a solar panel. Um, than, than it would to create it with oil. Like right. if we could surpass that, it'd be far better. So when I work for the Northwest Power Planning Council, the best source for power, and, and I agree with their analysis, although this is going to sound like a bullshit answer, but let me just say it and then I'll qualify it in a moment. The best source of power, hands down, is conservation. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like, okay, that's not exactly the sorts of power. You still need something if you're going to run your laptop. And it's like, uh, and you know how we're addicted to these damn contraptions. And so here we are on the internet doing this show. You got to have some electricity. But um, 
I think that if you give me a level zero person and, 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 you, and you give me uh, six months with them or a year, that I could cut their power consumption all around by oh, yeah. 96, 97%. Now it's like they just need some teeny tiny solar panels and they're good. So it's kind of like they, they don't need a whole hell of a lot. We should um, do a course, man. I'm actually, uh, if you see that, if you, I mean, for those, for those people that are on the dailyish email, part of the permies.com stuff, for those people that are in the secret inner circle, which is for people who supported my past Kickstarters, and for people that are on uh, part of the pie program, then all of these people know that I'm working on a book. Yeah, and and th this is what the the book is a lot about. This and, and if you're part of the pie program, you get special access. You can read part of the book. Yeah, yeah, what we've written so far, and give feedback and and help influence the future of this thing. And um, but the funny thing is, is that for the last three or four months, I've been working on two Kickstarter projects simultaneously. And my philosophy on Kickstarter is. Don't start the Kickstarter until you've done the legwork. And so I've been doing the legwork on two projects, and I didn't know which one would be ready for the Kickstarter first. But there is one that, that like, I'm probably, my Kickstarter probably start in about a week, maybe a week and a half, maybe at the outside two weeks. And so then that, and that's why I want to talk about rocket ovens. Hey, hey. Josiah, did you know about rocket ovens? I know you were here. <laughs> you were here. You saw it fired up. You probably ate some of the cookies and the pizza and stuff that we made with the rocket oven. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, there's the book. Uh, and more about that, you know, if you're part of my empire. And then we'll reveal that later. Um, and and I, hope, I hope the Kickstarter does well because, wow, we're putting a lot of time into that. <laughs> but uh rocket ovens I, I i wanted to mention an hour like almost out of time um i wanted to mention like uh uh one if if you're off grid if you really want to do off grid and and it's like um i mean don't you like spaghetti flavored cake <laughs> which is another way of saying lasagna yeah. and and then of course let's not forget uh pie uh cookies bread pizza you know which is pizza pie it's kind of a pie uh more pie other kinds of pie so there's you know we could we could spend... zones oh yeah oh. i mean muffins <laughs> yeah. uh, i mean there's there's a list of amazing stuff that comes from an oven and it's like okay but you're living off grid so what do you do and and it's like a lot of people right now are doing propane and it's like i'm sorry propane is not off grid that is that is what do you, it's LPG. What do you think the P stands for? Petroleum. It's not like you can go wander around in the woods and then find yourself uh, some propane. Um, that's not how it works. And, uh, and it's like you're not going to find electricity or natural gas that way either. Or thorium or uranium, Josh. <laughs> so um, I do think it's possible to do the, the biogasing, but that's another thing that's, and, and, and as far as I know, that's that's got uh some some room for improvement still although maybe your video is is has like solved that issue um but uh a rocket oven i mean there's also the concept of the wood cook stove but those run really smoky and they still use a lot of wood to get the job done um but a rocket oven i mean um the other thing is those wood cook stoves those really beautiful old school wood i mean those are like four thousand to six thousand dollars those are expensive so uh, uh but a rocket oven we've gotten to the point where um at this time you can build everything like the stand and the the j-tube and then the oven itself everything in three days um and we've got a design now where it requires um minimal tools and zero welding and the, the food is better like like if you go to a pizza place like an authentic awesome pizza place they're cooking in a wood fired cob style oven yeah but that's going to be a black oven 
And so it's like your pizza is in there with all of the smoke, all of the, all of the Bernie bits. Well, actually, yeah, yeah, for, for the pizza. I was just thinking about... Um, and this is, we're focusing on a white oven, mm -hmm. which is an indoor oven. Right. So we're trying to do an indoor thing. So earlier there was talk on the chat about um, an, an outdoor rocket stove. And it's like, we've got to be so careful about, about vocabulary. The vocabulary stuff has been just causing all sorts of problems. So the rocket oven design is for indoor use. Well, indoor, outdoor. You could do indoor or outdoor. But um, uh, it, is, it, it has an exhaust that takes the exhaust outside um, and, and directs it wherever you want to go. But um, uh, the big thing is, is that when, you, when you're trying to be better about your energy usage, like we were just talking about, at some point, you got to take a look at how you cook your food. And if you're really concerned about these problems, whether it's a, uh, all the problems that come on the other end of electric, like coal stuff and, and your nuclear stuff or, or, you know, whatever is your concern on the other end of that wire, um, or for natural gas, if you're concerned about the fracking or all of the other things that come with natural gas, uh, if you're concerned about any of that, and people are like, okay, I'm going to do something about it. And, and it's like lately I've been hearing so many people talk about, I'm going to save the earth because I'm going to stop using straws when I go to a restaurant. And I'm kind of thinking like, uh, that's, that's like not so even 1%. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the things that we're talking about, we're talking about like, okay, let's do 97% solutions here. And so I think that, that cooking it is a thing. And it's like, and then some people are like, oh, I, I don't really cook at home. I go to restaurants. Well, how do you think they're cooking your food? Um, and so if you're really con so there's a thing about being concerned about these things. I already bought the bulbs, Josh says. <laughs> oh, fuck you. <laughs> fuck you, Josh. <laughs> fuck you. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, we are out of time. So for the uh, live free show that everybody is seeing now, uh, hope you enjoyed the, the show, but we did not get to the uh, keeping your spring snow melt on your property. So what I think we should do, Paul is for the folks that are members of uh, your Patreon or uh, supporters of Perme Ethos buying one of our courses, they're in the, the real chat. They get an after show, so we continue yep. the show afterwards, and we'll talk about that uh, in the after show. Yeah, uh, I've got some important stuff to say about that. My last thought on our, our discussion we just had, I think that is is um, what, what upsets me the most isn't, uh, I'm going to stop using straws. At least they're doing something themselves instead of this. And this is what I hate. They should, or the government should yeah. do this. That pisses me off. Morning. You want to talk about negative progress. That's how you get less progress is involving the government. In my uh, opinion, it's more about your actions that you take. And if, if it's straws for you, okay. <laughs> and the book, the book that I'm working on is all about things that people can do in their backyard or, you know, in their own lives, um, as opposed to, uh, yeah, what they should do. And it's all about, you know, doing, doing stuff yourself instead of being angry at bad guys, you know, build a better world instead of being angry at bad guys. Perfect. So if you guys want to sneak peek at that uh, book, head over to permies.com and get some pie. Check out the pie program. You get tons of discounts on all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's vendors that have discounts to all their products. You get access to special podcast videos. Uh, you get access to the book, part of the book that's being written. You can give your feedback and shape the book. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye.